Welcome one and all to another edition of the Default Show with Luby here on the Five Reasons Sports Network, brought to you by Water Cleanup of Florida. We've had lots of rains down here lately. That's when things can pop up around your home or your office. Before you get that anxiety feeling, believe me, I know it all too well. We had it at our at our home. Who did we call? Who should you call? Water Cleanup of Florida, 954-579-0356. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Michael, Robert, their entire team will take care of you. They will not only drive the area, they will not only fix it, but because they're licensed contractors, insured, certified, have like licensed, insured, certified contractors on their staff, they'll make it look as good as new. One-stop shop, that's what they give to you. Water Clean by Florida, if you have any water issues when it comes to any water issues, but leaks as well before it gets to that water damage, because that's the thing is when it gets to major, they'll handle it and they'll do a good job. But if you spot a leak, it'll make everything a lot easier for them and for yourself. 954-579-0356. Check them out on their website, wcufl.com. Check them out on the socials, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at Water Cleanup FL. And if you want more, Advice, more tips, more confirmation at just how great Water Cleanup Florida is. Go to Google. More than 70 plus five star reviews. Water Cleanup of Florida again, 954 579 0356. If you have the schmutz, they have the guts. Talking lots of guts. The Miami Dolphins have had the guts lately. The Canes, not so much. We talked about it all on this week's edition of Pigskin Play- Playbook with the one only John Kinjemi right here. The Default Show with the Luby on the Five Reasons Sports Network. It's good seeing you on the tube by yesterday. You look great as always, and, and it's good to have you on the program today. And, uh, you know, where do you stand with the anatomy of a bye week? Uh, you know, you, you had nothing to react to from last week, except, you know, unfortunately the Bills managed to uh, come back and, and win that game. But uh, here are the Dolphins atop the uh, AFC East, and they have a stinking team coming in here, uh, the Houston Texans, who, who were showing a little bit of fight, even though they were like 1-7-1. and one. Uh, earlier uh, this year, I don't know what they are now. One eight and one, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. But uh, they got trounced by the Commanders, who I, I think have been one of the surprise teams uh, in the NFL. But uh, there wasn't too much to say. I mean, uh, you would anticipate it's a twelve point line that that this was going to be a fairly easy eighth victory for the Miami Dolphins. It should be. You know, the last time the Dolphins were favored this much, it was over the Houston Texans in their inaugural year, and I think they beat the Miami Dolphins. Back in 2000, they did. Yeah. In fact, that was a great yes. occurrence for me. That, that was their That's second year yeah. of the uh, Texans. Jay Something Fiedler like threw that, a pick right? at the Way end of the game. When. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm sure you had you had something on the line there on that on that. Play well, it, it was huge. I'm, I'm just guessing. Yeah, I, I was in one of those. Uh, they, they used to call them suicide pools, uh, but uh, yeah. I guess that, yeah. that's not not in vogue anymore. To Survivor, refer to it, so what do they call it? Elimination pools. All right, so uh, that week, that, that was the biggest spread on the board. It was the opening day, and the Dolphins were at home, and they were favored like by like 13, 14 points. And uh, Houston beat them straight up. And, and of the, I think there were like 68 people in the pool, uh, 63 of them had uh, the Dolphins as their pick because they just wanted to get through week one. Survivor pool, they call it now. Yeah, yes. survivor and, uh, pool. There you go. So it was great. I, I, I was cut loose. I took the Bears, and they eked out a victory. Because uh, we just figured, okay, everybody's going to have this game. Let's hope they lose. And it was one of those deals where I'm at the stadium, sort of representing the Dolphins. I'm going to do the post game show. I'm going into the locker room after the game. I'm down on the field, and as I see the guy intercept Fiedler and come back for a score, I quietly turn to the poly man and go, "Nice pick." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and then then we went on to win the pool, which was great. That's awesome. So you know, I do remember that distinctly. That That's a good feeling to have. And I'm sure the Dolphins are going to have a good feeling going in, coming off the bye week, because they've been really good since Tua came back from being in concussion yep. protocol and from the Whenever injury. I don't, think, I don't think he's thrown a, an interception since. Um, they've punted just three times over the last couple of weeks. They that's didn't crazy. punt against the Cleveland Browns, which is the fifth time, just the fifth time in, in franchise history that they've done and that. History, wow. Yeah, and it it hasn't happened since 2003. So it's one of those things where the Dolphins on offense, you feel like they're going to score points. They're going to do what they need to do. And I think the defense is starting to come around. You know, five times this season, they've held the opposition to under 200 yards passing. So, you know, you miss Byron Jones, but do you really miss him now? You know, with 
young guys coming on the scene, you know, Kohu and, and Crossan and, and Bethel, these guys are coming in and playing opposite X and they're doing a really good job. Linebackers, you got a thumper in the land and Roberts and you've got the equalizer and, and Jerome Baker. And now you've got, even though you lose Ogba for the season, you get, Bra- you know, you get Chubb in a position where you match him up with Phillips and Ingram and Wilkins on the inside with Sealer, and you can put, throw Van Ginkle in there. This team's loaded with, with talent. And it's just not, it's just not guys, you know, you're crossing your fingers when they get their reps that you're hoping they do a good job. They're all impact players. And week in and week out, you match up this roster against who they're going up against. Most of the time, you're going to take the Dolphins. Well, let me, let me ask you because, I mean, you played into the pros, high school, college. A bye week, a lot of the time a bye week can hurt because you have momentum going, but we haven't seen the Dolphins have some injury issues. A guy like Byron Jones, who they're really hoping to get back in December. Um, uh, when the offensive line, they've had some injury issues to himself, you know. So for a team like this that was rolling, and they were rolling, they were playing as good as anyone in football, and they finally saw that compliment from their defense, is a bye week a good or a bad thing? I think it's 50 50 and it it all depends on the the timing in the pass offense. I I think the offensive line has done a really good job with the guys that they've, and and they've been playing better. They've been getting to the second level and you've seen, you know, the addition of Wilson added with Moster gives you so much speed that they're getting to the second level. So it's a compliment to the play action pass and what two has been able to do on the outside with Hill and Waddle and the rest of the crew here field. They, they've done a nice job of complimenting each other over the past month, especially the last couple of weeks since Wilson has been here yep. because he seems like he's a guy that you can't really contain. Mostert's going to hit that one or two runs a game, but this guy gives you consistency with speed, and a, he's a, he finishes runs yep. as well. He can make you miss or run over you. So those are the traits you like to see. I, I just think it's more about Tua and, and Tyreek, really. Um, can they can they come back and, and continue on like the, the bye week was never here? I think those are the things you, you, you cross your fingers about because sometimes when you have such fast guys and you're in a rhythm, it doesn't matter if they take the proper steps or go the right depth or come out of the break just the way you want to because he's created so much room for the thrower mm. to put the ball anywhere close and he's going to come up with the catch. Yeah. Now you're a week off. Does that gap widen with his mistakes on the route or shortening of a route or going too long and and the timing in the pocket has been so good the ball's been out quickly is somebody cut free does somebody impede that that process and now you got to kind of go back and say all right who is it the quarterback is it the receiver is it the line you haven't had those problems you haven't had to worry about anything really on offense call a play and, and let it fire mcdaniel's had you know free reign to go over his 24 plays that they that they rep during the week that they have on a script and he can deviate from it he can stick to it it really doesn't matter because they've been scoring they haven't really punted the football as i said so they've been calling plays and they've been executing you just hope that it's close to that because if it is you know going down the the stretch of the season with seven games left majority of them on the road you have to you know pack your defense on the road but you also have to get first downs and those are the things you, you know you cross your fingers that they continue to happen for the Miami Dolphins. McDaniel continues to be and maybe even widens the gap as a departure between uh, any prototypical head coach in, in terms of approach that we see in the National Football League. Uh, I believe he compared the bye week. I, I don't know if uh, you guys uh, were playing this clip at all, uh, but uh, I think that's where I saw it. Uh, he compared the bye week. People ask him the same question Luby just posed to you, uh, is it beneficial or not? And he said, it's kind of like uh, looking at a lottery ticket when you don't mm-hmm. know what the winning numbers are. Yeah. Do you have a winner or not? But well, well, we don't know. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, that's a strange response, but I do appreciate the gambling <laughs> reference there uh, by McDaniel. It, it seems like, as you said, though, what, John, that, that the, the defense uh, has gotten better in spite of the fact that they've had, uh, you know, uh, problems uh, with personnel and haven't really, uh, you know, put together the guys on the field that, you would have anticipated they would have liked to at the beginning of the season with, with Byron Jones being one of those guys. And they've had other guys uh, I- injured and, and uh, compromised uh, like the X-Men and 
So, you know, they, they've, they've managed, though, to, to get better defensively, or so it seems. I, and I don't know that they're just playing poor teams so much. Well, they've been able to stifle everybody in this four game stretch, which was so critical after they dropped to three and three. It has to do a little bit about their their competition. But remember, Detroit and Chicago, Detroit could score. score. Those were one score games, you yeah. know, in teams that you felt like when you look at them on paper, we should beat this team. We should beat this team by double digits. You know, they're not going anywhere. We are. Um, and the same way with the Cleveland Browns, you know, they come out with an opening kickoff around the 50 yard line, go right down the field and score at seven, nothing. And you're thinking, Oh no, not the Cleveland Browns. And then, you know, you kind of settle in yep. and, and the Dolphins talent take over. And at some point, you know, you can score a lot of points on offense, but you got to shut them down on defense as well. And I, I think some of those young guys that I mentioned that are playing in unison, you know, with X on one side and Holland and Rowe. Uh, now that Byron Jones, uh, you know, might be in the mix later. Um, I don't know. I don't even know if they, if the Dolphins, you always could need a, a player of the caliber of that. Yeah. But if he's going to take a while to get in rhythm, mm-hmm. hey, we're already in rhythm on, on the outside. Yeah. I, I think they're going to go with the guys that have got him there. And I don't know if he's even going to be available come the month of December. You're hoping he is because it gives you another player to throw out there on defense. But right now, He's probably the least of the Dolphins' worries. John Kajemi with us here on the program, the Pigskin Playbook, brought to you by Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill. That's mile marker 104, the overseas highway in Key Largo. All right, so I'm getting on the uh, Alta Conquer flight out of Atlantic City, and uh, I'm boarding the plane. Uh, the Mustang, and, and we don't normally do this, but uh, she actually requested, and we were willing to pay for this, uh, a seat change. Because there was a rather rotund woman who also had uh, an unfortunately distinct odor. And she was in the aisle seat. Mustang would have been stuck in the middle. She had already, at the minute we got off the plane coming there, you have the same seats coming and going on this charter flight. Oh, really? Oh, no, the no. Same seats, Two right? They just, it's good in, in some ways, but it wasn't in this case because of this uh, sort of, you know, horrendous situation with this, uh, you know, it looked like a sumo wrestler, this woman. I, I'll... I'll you know, don't want to be too delicate about it. And, and, and as I said, she could have used like a breath mint and a deodorant. Uh, would have been great. So she had already told me as soon as we got, you know, a deep plane, the Mustang turns to me and goes, you have the middle seat on the way back. <laughs> so so we, we changed seats. And the reason I bring this up is because I was on the plane. And, uh, you know, so now I'm, I'm in the window. And this woman is not only in the aisle seat, but she's also now encompassing most of the middle seat, <laughs> even though the Mustang's not there. So I, I had to reach for my phone uh, so just before we take off. And I, I see there's a text there, and it's from Jim Sarney. And he asked me if I could, if I was still in Atlantic City, if I could bet 20 bucks on him or for him. For the Dolphins to win the Super Bowl. Oh, Jesus. Now, $20 investment there. I yeah, mean, they're fine. not going to, you know, break a guy like Sarney. I, I think he was the heir to a uh, gigantic fortune from some uh, dry cleaning business in uh, New England. But uh, and, and, you know, he made plenty of money as a journalist himself. I mean, it's certainly I was going to say, I think he did his, his own work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, he did well. <laughs> he he read books and papers time. and everything. <laughs> but was that $20 going to be misguided, in your opinion? Or uh, w- would you not say... It was at least worth a slight shot, John Kajemi, at this point. I think it's worth a slight shot. Uh, you look at the teams in the AFC East. <clears throat> you know, if the Jets win the game, they're in first place against New England. They didn't, yeah. they're in last place. So it's it's a one, one and a half, one and a hook game, you know, in, in the East. But as you look at the conference, Kansas City, yeah, they're still probably, you know, the team to beat. Buffalo, they've had some warts over the last couple of weeks, but they're they're kind of finding their way around. It all comes down for the Miami Dolphins. Yeah, they have, you know, they have Houston this week where they got to take care of business at home. Then that they have should, three road games. That should games. put us at eight, by the way. Yes, that's makes a the good rest of the schedule. Very right. significant, it's, it, yes. It's very significant. I don't want to, you know, don't make that it, a yeah. moot point. That's a big, that's a big hurdle yeah. to climb for the Dolphins. But they go on the road to San Fran, who looks the part. They look yeah, a little better, yeah. They look, they, look, scary, they, look, yeah. they look better, right? The Chargers, it could be hit or miss. I don't know. They're either going to score some points, it'll be competitive, or the Dolphins are going to roll. Suspect you know, defense, though, with the Their Chargers. Defense yeah. is weird. Like, I don't get it. They have so much talent. I just, I thought they were going to be a better team. Injuries but, uh, really yeah, have uh, yeah. hurt them. But the season is going to come down to the AFC East. You've got yeah. Buffalo on the road, cold weather, could be, you know, terrible environment. Yeah. Uh, you've got New England on the road. 
and then the Jets come here yeah. the, the final week. Now, the, the worst thing that could happen to the Jets for the Dolphins is if they bench the rookie quarterback <laughs> because then wow, you're he was horrible. Have a chance. Did you watch you, that? You, yeah, I watched a lot of it. Wow. And it was it was just a you know three three punt fest back and forth, back and forth. I was surprised the Jets didn't run the football to to, to see if Belichick still would have made them punt or they would have just said, you know what, let's just get the the overtime. Um, yeah. but they end up punting the football and and the rest is history for the Jets. But those three games will determine where the Dolphins are seated. I, I believe, you know, are they, do they host a game? If they host a game, enormous. If they go have to go on the road in a cold weather environment again, let's go back and, and retrace to see how they did in Buffalo, how they did in New England, because notoriously the Dolphins don't play well in those spots. So the next, uh, yeah, the next revolution in America, by the way, John, is not going to happen if Trump gets reelected and, and you know, people start storming a Capitol building on a daily basis. Uh, it's going to be uh, people revolting against the, the NFL and their relation with FanDuel if they continue to have just blind and inconsistent officiating. Because uh, on, on that punt return, there's a clear block in the back. I have never seen such a clear example of it. As uh, and the last potential tackler uh, would stop this guy at the 16, uh, gets taken out from behind by a Patriot uh, special teams player, and uh, and then a the guy waltzes in and scores. Now, all right, you're watching a dreadful game, you're thinking, okay, thank God it's over, I, I don't have to go to overtime. But if you were betting the game, it was an entirely different story. Because right. if they call that penalty, then uh, now Nick Falk, who had already missed two, uh, you know, medium range field goals. Uh, a is going to have to go out there and kick a field goal because there was no time left at, at that point. There were like five seconds left to go in a ball game, and uh, so if he misses that, now you're in overtime. If you're a Jet fan in a significant game in terms of the standings, and as you said, very impactful on all of the dynamics of what's going to happen in the postseason to many teams, possibly. And uh, you know, at the worst, if you're a better, he kicks the field goal, and you're you're you know exuberant about the fact that uh, and exhilarated by the fact that you covered three and a hook with the Jets. So, I, I, I mean, that was appalling to me. I, how, how can they, uh, you know, continue uh, to, uh, you know, be in the gambling business if they're going to have, uh, you know, that kind of inconsistency in officiating is what we talked about, you know, all of the roughing the passer. But th this happened in plain sight in front of everybody. And that the announcers, was, they, they skipped it. I don't know how you would have felt, I, you know, uh, what your approach there's would another crew. There's another crew that skipped a call completely. Yeah. That game w was, it was definitely a block in the back. Yeah. Announcers don't say anything. Nothing. Touchdown, game's over, New England wins. M Illinois at Michigan. It's it's fourth and three. Michigan's got the ball. They run a rub pick play oh, was an offensive in front of the Michigan oh, yeah. bench. Like blatant? The, the Michigan uh, wide receivers blocking two defenders from the <laughs> Illini down the field. Down the, the back field? Goes into, yeah, right off the ball, down the field, five five to seven yards off the ball. The back goes into the flat. They complete the pass. Uh, I can't. I think it was Blackledge and um, and uh, oh, it does with Blackledge. Gosh, I forgot. I can't think. Oh, is it? Is it yeah. um, oh no, the guy from Boston. I was gonna I say, what's it, the legendary announcer's yeah. son, McDonough? Right, Sean McDonough. McDonough. Sean McDonough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sean McDonough. Blackledge. So Sean yeah. and and Todd are doing the game. They don't say a word. See, I, and, okay. and, and so you, let me ask you: you You've it. done broadcasting for years. Yeah. Will they tell you don't talk about refs? Is that something that's ever discussed? Because no, announcers never, never talk about the refs, and I, I'm like, never. come on, like who cares? That's never. I've never had a producer, director, a VP ever come up and. That's say, what you're there for is okay. is to make these. Comments. They do that all the time, no? and I don't get it. Yeah. Well, I'm sure everybody at home, you know, if you're it didn't really, if you're a Michigan fan, you didn't say anything. <laughs> but you know, yeah. Illinois fan, you're 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 on your couch or your chair. You're going, oh, that's coming back. There's no doubt. And and it's funny because uh, Bielema, the head coach, put it out on Twitter, I think, you know, later that day saying this is was not called, you know, and he was he gave the officials uh, all an earful, you know, going off. But, you know, all they're going to do is go, yeah, you were right on Monday when they send the clip in, they send yeah. it back. Oh, we're wrong. You were right, but you could have cost us the game. <laughs> exactly. There are always things of that nature that will be discussed after, uh, you know, any sporting competition, and especially seems uh, so in, in football. Uh, you know, and, and the tough part about that is it's just like a guy that's blowing balls and strikes all night. 
and then calls a guy out on a pitch that he'd been calling a ball all night long. And, and you know, you see the batter uh, turns around and he's living. Uh, manager gets thrown out of the game. But, uh, you know, if you're going to call some of this, you know, really borderline stuff early in ball games, you, you can't let go of the blatant stuff at the end. And, and that's a thing that, you know, I think fans, even, you know, I mean, honest fans will, will look and say, hey, you know what? It happened with the Dolphins a couple of times. Uh, yeah. Forget, I guess Chicago. it was two weeks back. Yeah. Chicago, where they yeah. just benefited, I mean, from both calls, uh, that one yeah. that wasn't made and one that was. Uh, you know, on a pass interference situation. And, you know, you're thinking, hey, if you're going to call like like suspect uh, penalties uh, early in the game, then you can't let this blatant stuff go uh, late in the ball game. Especially, I mean, it's magnified by the fact that, that that was not only a huge differential in the overall scheme of the uh, National Football League playoff and, uh, you know, standings and dynamics, but, I mean, it killed a lot of betters. It really yeah. did. And it benefited some, but, uh, you know, it's like a bad call at the track where, you know, you've seen a horse taken down for, uh, you know, the same type of foul a million times, and then they let one go, and you're like, okay, the stewards were probably punching tickets uh, right after the race <laughs> on that. Hey, hey uh, you know, is Pittsburgh going to ruin Miami's season and chance to go to a ball game? Coming in, aren't they coming into town this week? Pittsburgh? They, they are. Uh, is it here? I was Saturday sure. night. I think it's Saturday night, 8 o'clock. Now, now are you being honored at halftime uh, by <laughs> Stephen Ross? No, by Stephen Ross. Like, like yeah. I mean, you could be Tim Tebow in this situation. <laughs> by Stephen that, Ross. That's right. <laughs> the only problem is Stephen Ross wouldn't have any idea who I am. I've worked there for, I don't know. <laughs> oh, really? You don't recognize uh, your no. great work there and uh, all of the stuff no. you've done with the Dolphins? Yeah. Huh? Like a all zombie right. would walk right by me. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I but, know the feeling. Um I don't know. It's a bad, as bad as Miami is, it's a bad matchup for Pitt because yeah. they don't score points. Oh, really? Get out of here. You're, you're no, I, I think so. I, I think it's a bad matchup for the Panthers because they don't score enough points on offense. Their defense can get after the quarterback. So I think it's going to be a low scoring game. I, I don't, I don't think, I don't see this game getting into, you know, 28, 24 range. Maybe it's, it's, you know, 2017, 2014, 2013, something like that. I, I just – the Pitt would have to, you know, do some things on offense in their passing game to make it – to make it really, you know, a, a game that the Panthers could win. I, I don't see – Wow, you don't even I, see them uh, winning necessarily. Not necessarily, no. I'm figuring it's blowout city and that's it. And Mario Cristobal has all, uh, you know, off season to explain. This, this game is going to revive Mario Cristobal, I think. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, wow. Okay. You have little faith. Johnny, what happened? Man. Did, did you get some <laughs> kind of him? negative uh, yeah, I'm just going know, feedback psychology. on your last contribution I'm, to I'm Pittsburgh? Building, I'm building reverse psychology <laughs> right now. I can't imagine. No, but I really do think I, I, the Panthers are a better team, but I, I just don't see them scoring a lot of points. How would they won their last few? They, they haven't that? won their last. I thought they won their they last did. few. They did. They games. beat yeah. uh, Duke 28 26, I think. Right. They beat Pitts, they, uh, Syracuse. They beat, beat Syracuse. Handily. But Syracuse was, was on a downturn. They, they, they lost two, they fell three, apart. four in a row. I yeah. Yeah. They do. yeah. Well, they've lost five they in a row Virginia. now. Yeah. They started out 6 and 0. Oh. So much for uh, my uh, resurrection of uh, the Larry Zonka days uh, at the Q's. Uh, that's not happening. I, I, I'm surprised that you're skeptical about this ball game. I really am. I, I don't know if you're just, like you say, no, uh, I, trying to I, go I, reverse I like, psychology. Well, being the one thing I'll guarantee, the one thing I'll guarantee. About Will you be game, on the sidelines for this game? No, I'm, unfortunately, I'm not going to be in town. Or I, oh, I would ah, like to have gone okay. to the game. But the one thing I'll guarantee is number zero for the Hurricanes will get a personal foul in this game to continue <laughs> his streak of like eight in a row. Right. He, he'll make a horrible play late and it'll be 15 yards against the Hurricanes. I'll guarantee you that. Yeah, I'm thinking the Canes go down. I, I was so unimpressed with their uh, uh, play uh, against Clemson. I, I know Clemson uh, seemed to, you know, everybody's been boning up on Syracuse and Clemson had its best game. But when they played the QC, even though Syracuse threatened them early in the game. But uh, for, for the Hurricanes, I mean, to, to just be a listless, lifeless, no factor in in any game this late in the season under the new uh, coaching staff, I, I, I thought was alarming. I, I really did. So well, uh, it, I would have given them no chance against Pittsburgh. Uh, coming I didn't up give them any night. chance against Clemson, and they kind of hung around. I don't know if it was, you know, they get, I, I think they got two or three turnovers right away in the third quarter. Yeah. To kind of make it a game, you know, it was a two touchdown game. Yes. And you felt like the Hurricanes, if they did anything, they might be able to to hang around. 
but it was yeah. more of you know I, I thought their defense put their helmet on the football a couple of times they made some nice plays but it was more of the mistakes of Clemson and and you know the the way the defense of Miami played that kept them around but uh, it, in the fourth quarter the separation took over. Remember when you had the belief, though, that, uh, you know, no matter what the circumstance, it could have been Oklahoma up 21 in the fourth quarter. And uh, you, you just had the uh, faith and, and the belief that the Hurricanes could dig their way out of any grave and come back, you know, and find a win. And, and now when, when you see them get behind by three points, you're like, eh. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's over. Which, uh, wow, I mean, that's such a radical departure from uh, where that, that, you know, I mean, that's one of the things. It's like Jimmy, you know, titled his book Swagger. It's it's one of the. I don't know that it's swagger so much, but uh, you know that, no, that belief. I, it, if it's they, not there, I mean, it's very hard to come by. It doesn't matter how much swagger you have if you don't have players. Yeah, you that's can't true. Win, and they don't have enough players. Didn't you always feel like when you were playing on no matter what, you could be down like ten nothing in a game of one on one to eleven, and you thought, oh, okay, I'll I make got a, a couple chance. jumpers here from the top yeah, of the key. Yeah, I still have yeah, a shot. Yeah, 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 I yeah. got a chance. Yeah, you know, I I think they the mentality's there, but I don't know if they have enough guys. I mean, for as much as they've they've talked about their defensive line, I don't know. I well, don't that, see it. Well, let me ask and, you because yeah. that's my thing is Kane's fans, and look I, again, we've talked about this. What they put out for him and the staff, they're not firing the guy. He's not in a hot seat. I, I, I'm not saying he is. The expectations nationally, the expectation from fans. although Ed Ogeron was in town, yeah. <laughs> his, his son's on the staff. So, anyways, <laughs> um, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to say that that's what their expectations were. Maybe inside the program, I've talked to people that said, "Well, you don't understand what's going on inside." Which I don't. Well, I, then I don't, why weren't they saying that outside? But whatever, fine. So they they felt it would be a tough year. Okay, cool. For me, though, looking at it from media or fan standpoint. I understand he's going to be here, but why is there? Why would there be confidence in him? Like what you're saying aligns with what Kane fans are saying now. That look, we believe in Mario because these aren't his kids. He's going to get his kids in there, okay? But with these kids, shouldn't he have at least done something with them? Weeded this out before this season to at least have just go young. That's what Norvell did. Norvell before that first year went uber young. Right. And they were not good, but every week they got better because they were his kids. Why did Cristobal not do that? He kept a lot of that roster together to try and win now is what I think it is, and it backfired, and they're not getting better, and now he's doing the rebuilding, rebuilding thing. And that's my problem is what you're saying is a lot of what Segreto saying. Well, they're going to rebuild. He just needs his players. But he wasn't saying that before. Why waste a year? To me, it feels like they wasted a year and didn't do in year one what they're probably going to do in year two. Well, I think they, they should have been better with the change of coaching staff, with the change of philosophy. No matter what you have, they didn't have stability at quarterback. And anytime you don't have stability and, and a guy that's going to be consistent week in and week out, that was probably the, the only position you felt, hey, at least we have a guy, a Heisman caliber quarterback, that's going to be able to at least mask a lot of the things that we're deficient at. Well, a lot of passes were dropped early in the season. And then the next week, a lot of passes were off the mark. Then that guy gets hurt and you have flux at your most important position. Um, along with the offensive line going to the third center, you know, seventh guard, wh wh you know, whatever the, whatever you're deemed, you know, is, is at fault with their offense. There's a lot of things. It just wasn't one thing. It just, if it was just the quarterback and they m remove Van Dyke from the equation and played the other two guys, and everything was solid around around that position, yeah, you might be able to mask it a little bit against some of the lesser teams in the ACC. But when the problems are dropping the ball, fumbling the football, allowing sacks, allowing pressures, uh, three and out, three and out, three and out, now the defense can't hold up their end because they're, they're breaking yes, yeah, yeah. You know, before they should. It, it's, a, it's a domino effect. And the, and the Hurricanes had that domino effect for multiple weeks in a row. And, and now it's, you know, you're as a head coach, you almost feel a little helpless. The only thing you have that the, the most energy on that team right now are the hype guys coming out at, you know, the TV timeouts <laughs> and the and, you know, get off the field, get off the field. You know, I, I would tell that guy, shut the fuck, get out of here, man. Go back on the sideline. You know, it's just like, it's the most meaning, meaningless thing 
gets the most attention and I'm a fan and I'm noticing that, like, yeah. get on the sidelines. Let the coach coach. You guys, you don't need to run off the field. It's 28 to 3, you know? We're, tr- we're, we're doing our best, but we're getting our asses kicked. I don't need you to hype me to come off the field on a TV timeout. The, I just think that there's a lot, yeah. lot of other issues that can be need to be addressed other than these guys. Mario's facial expressions are starting to resemble uh, Jerry Faust uh, <laughs> when he was on the sideline there for Notre Dame. I was just like befuddled by uh, what was going on out there. Uh, the uh, bookies uh, don't share your concern, uh, John, uh, with Pittsburgh. They have them as six and a half point favorites on the road. For I'm this just game. saying, I, next time we talk, it'll be yeah. it'll be it'll be a closer game than that, I think. Or or Miami's gonna, you know, just I, I just I just don't. I just don't know. I don't. I don't feel. I watched Pitt now for the last couple of weeks. Yeah. They're better than Miami, but I don't. I don't really trust how they're getting it done. You know, at, I, I can't remember the. Kid's I think name. Charlie Partridge is uh, salivating right now, thinking about sacking these uh, UM quarterbacks. That's the thing is, well, that that's the that's advantage the Pitt has. Yeah. The advantage Pitt has, if they can get to the quarterback, and they can stop Miami's running game when they try to, you know, offset. That pressure, that'll be the biggest key to the game. If if the Panthers get four or five sacks, you know, that that's that's where they can control the line of scrimmage. I just don't trust them scoring in the twenties this week, unless they get a defensive score. All right. That's fair, man. John Kajemi, I, I figured you'd be, uh, you know, uh, playing a Vuvuzela here on the show, uh, <laughs> down, blowing, a, blowing a horn for Pittsburgh. Hey, I will give John Jimmy credit. He has been a Finn Sider in the past. He's worked alongside the Dolphins for years. He does, I think, post-game, pre-game, a lot of stuff with CBS 4 for the Dolphins. But he was very honest about the Dolphins going into the year. He was not sure how good they'd be. Very happy to see where they are now. The Miami Hurricanes, he's been very tough on them. But he also is a Pittsburgh Panther alum. And where Defoe and I both thought he would sing the praises of the Panthers. And they played better, and the Canes are struggling. He said, you don't know. The way the Canes' defense has played, has played pretty well. That, the Pittsburgh offense has struggled. It could be a dogfight. We shall see. I actually think Pittsburgh should handle the Canes, but you never know. Maybe Crystal Ball has figured something out. They did keep the game close with Clemson into the halftime. Of course, second half, Clemson blew the doors off the game. But, you know, they hung around, and Crystal Ball is still trying to find his way. The Miami Dolphins, every single week, seem to be finding their way coming off a bye. And the Texans, yeah, the Dolphins have struggled with the Texans in the past, but... Texans with one win. Texans are, are strongly going for that tanking for Bryce Young or C.J. Stroud or whatever quarterback is there at the top of the NFL draft boards. Hopefully the Dolphins can get that win, get to 8-3, and three, and really be in that race for that top 3-4 in the AFC and the race for the AFC East. We'll talk a lot more about that as things go on. Check us out each and every morning, 7-9, on the Default Show. It'll be on the South Florida Live Network. So just look up South Florida Live. YouTube or Google, look up the Default Show with Luby on YouTube or Google. Check us out. Also, our the Believe Network had a fun conversation today with Josh Booty talking college football. If you love college football, this guy knows his college football. National champion with the LSU Tigers. Really great college football analyst. The Believe Network, B-L-E-A-V dot com. Search after hours. And our South Florida content right here. The Default Show with Luby on the Five Reasons Sports Network. Hey, folks, Tony Segreto here. Let me ask you a question. What do you look for when you go out to eat? Good food, obviously. Friendly atmosphere, not too loud, but good energy, reasonable prices, and a place where you feel comfortable. All those ingredients, (laughs) no pun meant there, are hard to find unless you're talking about the Texas Roadhouse. You see, they encompass all of those attributes. Really, really good food. Amazing atmosphere. Good for a family. Good for a date or just a night out for yourself. And prices that will make you extremely happy. Their ribs unmatched. Steaks, hand cut every day. Everything, and I mean everything, is made on site, including their incredible bread. It's the one day, folks, that you can forget about low-carb diets. Trust me when I tell you, Texas Roadhouse, your restaurant, your destination, when you say, where should we go and eat tonight? These days, we're all looking for comfort anywhere we can find it. Thank goodness for Landlubbers, Raw Bar and Grill in the plantation because they are making sure you are as comfortable as possible. First of all, they're not only open for delivery and pickup. All you have to do is go to landlubbersbarandgrill.com for both pickup and free delivery. You're going to have the best wings in the world. You're going to have a great burger. You're going to have their amazing soups. Again, 
Landlubbers, raw bar, and grill. It's nice and easy. Just go to landlubbersbarandgrill.com for both your pickup and free delivery. Thank goodness for Landlubbers for making you always feel right at home.